I hope each one of you are well and safe because we're going to be having a really interesting discussion in this two-day conference that is organized by the Goethe Institute Indonesia, the German Embassy Jakarta, Deutsche Welle, and also Project Motatuli. In this conference, we will have experts from Southeast Asia and Europe who will have a conversation in the transformation of journalism and news consumption in the digital age. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Pita Kusuma, and I'm the correspondent for Deutsche Welle, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. So before we um, move on to the panel discussion, let me uh, tell you that we will have a question and answer session at the end of the panel discussion and participants are welcome to ask questions by using the chat feature on the left sidebar so please type your questions on the global chat and we also will provide a live interpretation service from english to indonesia and vice versa and you can use this feature by clicking interpretation on the bar below and choose the language you wish to hear so the session is about is there a place for journalism in social media. This is a very interesting topic. Um, the public increasingly use social media as the primary source of news. And it is also a stage for personal opinion and unverified information. Thus a challenge for users to figure out the veracity of the news it disseminates. So how will journalism evolve in the face of social media? And how can news organization build trust in the midst of information overload? So. Let's hear what our first speaker have. Uh, we have Imam Safingi, uh, was engaged in self-learning video production and graphic design throughout his university years. Imam's professional experience ranges from TV journalism, video production, graphic design, and content creation and communication. Imam's area of expertise is creative communication for humanitarian, advocacy, empowerment, and sustainable activities. Uh, he has worked with various organizations, including media companies, nonprofits, social enterprises, and the government. So based on the perception that various information sources increasingly flood media channels, in 2021, he founded Perupa Data, which filters, compiles, and visualizes current information in a single infographic. So to Imam Safingi, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, basically, I'm here to learn uh, I, I would uh, hear many uh, interesting many inspiring uh, stories uh, tips uh, information that, that I could hear from uh, from anyone here not only the speakers but also the the, the, the attendees of this event uh, but yeah I'm, I, I, I want to share about the story of uh, what what I've been uh, doing that's what uh, uh, one year and a half uh, uh, also, a correction that, that, that I started a group data in uh, 2020. Um, it, it was in, in, in April last year. And this is um, uh, a story about, about uh, what, I, what, I, uh, what, I, what I do, what I, what I have been doing with, uh, with my channel. Uh, should I share, share screen? Uh, can, can you see my screen already? Yes, we can see it clearly. Okay. Uh, should I continue? Sorry. Yes, sure, you might as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, I, I would introduce about Prabhupada first. So basically, uh, the idea of uh, starting this channel is to uh, collect information, the facts. It can, be, it can be news, it can be release, it can be statement. We compile them, uh, analyze them, design them in the visual and then share them. Uh, and I, 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 I can tell you why I did this in the first time uh, uh, later on, on, the, on, on, the, on the other slide. So uh, this is what I feel about social media. Uh, this is also the story behind Bruba Data. Uh, social media can be uh, both useful, um, interesting, can be inspiring, but it can also be dangerous. It can also be scary. And the reason behind uh, this opposite uh, situation is actually the same, uh, the same thing, that everyone can share everything. And with everyone can share everything, uh, we cannot avoid the information plot. Information is everywhere, anywhere, expected or not, accurate or not, verified or not. And I read a... Uh, a journal uh, from uh, Reuters Institute, and 
University of Oxford that uh, the main risk in uh, uh, sharing or gathering uh, intimacy, the needs uh, for ver verification, and the loss of control over the information. And this is my uh, my observation toward the social media that there are uh, accounts or channels with a uh, big audience or big followers. There are also uh, some other accounts with uh, with smaller audience. Sometimes both can share uh, accurate information or inaccurate information. If it's the big audience sharing a uh, Accurate information, uh, I would say that this can be a disaster because uh, what they share is sometimes a uh, hoax. It is sometimes uh, not relevant to the uh, to the current issue. It is sometimes um, misleading, but it's followed by uh, many people, and uh, it is uh, dangerous that people, uh, most of the followers, may. Um, may think that this is something uh, 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 can be trusted and they will follow this uh, this information uh, regardless of of the of the source even if 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 something uh, misleading is shared by uh, accounts or channels with a smaller audience this can still uh, potentially be um, be an issue or be a, be a problem uh, in an in, a, in an op 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 site what uh, what we are aiming uh, with with provide data is uh, that we we want to be uh, a platform um, with the big audience to share uh, accurate information, the verified information from the verified source and data and facts that can be uh, helpful for people uh, either to they, they can use for for their. Uh, uh, for any purposes or uh, as uh, to their way of life or or uh, even uh, even farther for the policy makers uh, to follow up uh, with with the situation that uh, we are compiling and informing so i would say that uh very uh, very good source is the, is key it is not the only key but it is a big key uh to get uh, the information uh right and clear uh, we need to uh, to uh, to check whether it is credible or it is up to date. So uh, I would uh, share you uh, the uh, the the story, uh, not the story, but uh, the work uh, behind the scene of Rupa Data. So how we get the information or the data or the facts that uh, that we compile into infographics. So we we are really uh, selective with with our sources. Uh, we are using the official data release. Uh, the um, the open data in Indonesia, especially uh, released by, by the government, is uh, still not uh, ideal. But at least it shows uh, progress. So to uh, so the digital transformation, um, many of the government officials or uh, government agencies have um, made digital transformation into uh, websites or other platform microsites or or so on to share uh, facts, to share data, to share achievement that we can access uh, publicly. And this is one of our main source of data uh, uh, that, that we think uh, it is uh, uh, something credible. Uh, it is something realized by the government. They, they just police, police the data. People may say that, but at least this is the official one. And we can, uh, uh, we can uh, refer to this data. Uh, the second one is official statement. Uh, this is also the <laughs> um, what we are thankful about digital transformation that uh, in the as uh, let's say ten years ago, and we need to uh, came to the presidential palace. We need to have the presidential press uh, pass, uh, in which I don't have one. Um, and uh, not, not to mention uh, the, the topic that we, we have to 
<laughs> uh, we see, uh, we see uh, the president, the ministers from everyone, uh, from the CEOs of the uh, of, of the companies, uh, right uh, from their uh, dissidents uh, YouTube uh, official channel, and uh, we also uh, have some. Uh, we also have statements uh, already uh, released or published by verified news. Uh, it is sometimes uh, difficult to verify uh, uh, if this news is credible or not. But uh, when there is a statement from, uh, let's say, official or uh, an actor of, of, of an issue or um, um, or any, anyone uh, with, with their quotes, uh, we need to check, we need to, to, to double check if it's only in, in one media or uh, it, it is also uh, published uh, to another media. And then we also rely on laws and regulations. Uh, sometimes uh, we know that uh, some minister or uh, some, uh, some key person or public, uh, pub public opinion leader or, or, or uh, some uh, public figures say an issue, say an, uh, a policy, say about a regulation, but uh, we cannot find uh, this um, stated in in a formal regulation, so we cannot uh, we cannot uh, conclude that uh, this information are accurate. So uh, we we uh, we are referring to the laws and regulations as well. Uh, yeah, this is also some some of uh, some of the examples. Uh, when it's not uh, verified, then then we dropped it. Uh, it is an example that uh, the president is about to. Uh, uh, the, the coordinating minister uh, for human development of culture of Indonesia uh, mentioned that the president is about to extend the PPKM or emergency uh, restriction till the end of July. Uh, he said that uh, in, in the mid of July and um, many of the uh, news um, channels made coverage of this, uh, of this uh, quotation or uh, made, made coverage of this, this statement or quotes. Uh, but uh, we did not uh, put ourselves in a rush uh, to uh, to make this into infographic and then publish to our channel. But uh, we we waited and see uh, because uh, we understood that this minister uh, is not in charge for the restriction. Uh, it is not a coordinating minister. And also, the statement did not come from uh, a press release or press conference uh, officially uh, published by the official channel. And later on, uh, just one day after this uh, statement, uh, the the, uh, the the responsible uh, coordinating minister, we know that uh, there's another coordinating minister, uh, he clarified that actually the president uh, needs uh, two or three additional days uh, to make uh, the final uh, decision and it was then uh, we knew uh, decided that it was no longer a PPKM darurat but uh, the the PPKM with uh, that level one to level four. It was also something that they went viral uh, with the narrative of uh, a friendly dog in Aceh was forced uh, to leave the island and was killed in the process. Uh, we found it helpful. Uh, we we were about to uh, jump into this issue, uh, making an infographic. Um, because uh, we, we understood that uh, this is something related to animal welfare and it is something that, uh, that, that there still needs to be a campaign in our country. Uh, but then uh, we found that uh, the source is uh, quite doubtful. It came only for, uh, from one uh, personal social media post. It was full of assumption, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, the, the halal tourism, uh, it, 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 was, it was not coming from, from the main source. Uh, as as the as the uh, and the reason behind uh, behind this action, and also no, no sufficient data both from the from from the post owner uh, from the uh, from the uh, what would you call it the, the resort owner uh, where 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 the, where the dog went, once lived, and even from the authority uh, it it was a clarification from the authority but. It had no sufficient data, so we left it. Uh, we we thought that we could not make an infographic from from this uh, data. It, it was not a data that can be verified well. Also, the third. Uh, sorry again, Mr. Minister, that <laughs> you were one of uh, our example that, that that appeared twice. So, so a few days ago, um, 
the minister uh, mentioned that uh, during the Christmas and your holiday, uh, the PPKM level three will be applied nationwide. Uh, and many of the news media, uh, news media companies uh, also uh, got in rush to make this into breaking news or headline news that uh, we again waited and saw what happened next because uh, it was later mentioned that uh, more details will be, um, uh, will be stated in the, in the decree. And then uh, we waited for two or three days until the decree was released uh, by the Minister of uh, Home Affairs. And uh, we, we had the, the evidence, the, uh, the verified data or verified fact uh, that, uh, that, that, we can, uh, that we can use, that we can uh, trust uh, to be the source of our infographic. Uh, so uh, there, there was one more, uh, one more thing uh, during the social media and uh, journalism and news you know, transformation. So let's say uh, in 2009 or 2010, when I was a journalist, uh, what we did with uh, social media was uh, the news article or, or uh, the news that we, that we produced uh, or we published already uh, to our uh, channel, uh, let's say um, on my channel or TV or a newspaper were then uh, shared uh, to the official uh, social media channel of the, of the news company. And people were then uh, uh, reshared them. It, it was what what happened uh, like uh, ten years ago. But but now it can be vice versa. Uh, the news uh, were are still shared into social media accounts of of the news company. But yeah, it, it is now common to see a conversation in in a YouTube channel becoming a news. An Instagram uh, caption of a public figure becoming a news, or even some of our infographics are becoming uh, news uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the news channels as news articles as well. I think uh, this is something that we we need to also uh, put attention because what we share to social media can sometimes be news, uh, regardless of how big or how small our platforms or our channels. Uh, and if it's something misleading, uh, this can fool the whole country uh, who, uh, who access the news. So uh, it is important for us, either we are uh, managing a, a social media channel, an unofficial social media channel, or just our personal social media channel that what are shared to our uh, channels uh, are only facts and truth. Uh, if it's our, uh, it is our opinion, uh, state that this is an opinion uh, so that we avoid uh, uh, that we become a part of uh, the spread of uh, misinformation. I think uh, that's what I, what I can prepare for now. Uh, this, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, this is an opportunity for me to, uh, to share what, what, I, uh, what I have been doing and uh, to learn uh, more uh, from any one of you. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Imam Safini, for an enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our participants have a lot of questions that pops up in their mind, but we'll get to that uh, question and answer later. But I will start to remind you again that you can start um, thinking about questions and typing it on the global chat. You can find it on the left sidebar. So let's move on to our second speaker. We have Yasmina al -Ganabi. She's a highly passionate and experienced audience development manager, trainer, and social media consultant with a demonstrated history of working in the broadcast media industry. She is currently working for Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster, and on behalf of the DW Academy and other organizations, she travels around the world and training journalists and NGOs in database work and social media, storytelling and news gathering and safety on social media. So to Yasmina Alganabi, the screen is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for having me here. So good morning, everyone uh, from Bonn. It's uh, 20 past seven here, but nevertheless, I will try to share with you my screen and bear with me if I'm a little bit slow in my mind at the moment. Um, so here I'm sharing the screen. I hope that you can see it. 
Yeah, thank you, Prita, for the heads up. So um, I also have a journalistic background. So everything that I'll be sharing with you today is not only from the perspective of an audience development manager, but also someone who has worked previously in uh, different uh, news departments here at Deutsche Welle. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Deutsche Welle, we provide uh, content in 33 languages by now. Uh, so you're more than welcome to follow us on all our social media appearances. And it's sometimes a little bit hard, especially from the middle European perspective to see what our audience actually wants. Um, so my main core point here is that I think whenever a uh, audience discovers us on social media, they're there for the topic. They discovered us pro uh, possibly uh, because of the topic, because of hashtag. But what makes them from a scroller to a clicker? It's actually if they realize that the account has a personality. So is there a place for uh, journalism in social media? To be honest, short disclaimer from my side, I think there is. Why? Well, here you have um, a few points. This is a statistic that was done um, in June this year. The share of adults who trust news the most. Um, here you see that across the world, regardless if it's like in Europe or in Africa or in Asia, whatever, people are losing more and more trust in uh, journalism, in media, in public broadcasters. Um, those of you who follow up with the news here in Europe, we've had a very big movement of far right parties who are claiming, so it's not only Donald Trump in the US, but also here in Europe, people who claim that we are fake news, that we have a specific agenda, that we would like to impose a certain idea, a certain agenda on people. And this is why more and more people are losing faith in journalism as a general, and spe especially in now during the pandemic, uh, people who are trying to avoid vaccines or whatever. I don't know how about you guys in Indonesia, but here in Germany, the rates of the unvaccinated people is still very high. This is why we're facing uh, a fourth wave of, of uh, the increasement of the amount of infections with COVID here in Germany, and the government would like to push the third jab, but it's taking some time. So our journalists or is journalism part of the problem let's be honest yes let's we have to be here <laughs> uh, very honest with ourselves because we stopped listening to our audience we stopped listening to what they want to see to they what they want to hear and to package the products that's appealing to them I know that it's hard as a journalist to consider yourself a service provider, but in the end of the day, we are. We are competing out there, not only with other broadcasters, with other media outlets, we're competing there with influencers, with content creators, with activists, and they're doing the job much better than we do because they listen. And this is why we have to do that as well. We have to try to listen to our audience and see what their user needs are, what they want us to produce to them. Because on the other hand, we still see that there is a high amount of people who believe in us. So it's probably just the packaging that we have to um, make a little bit different. And in a few moments, I will share with you how we could do that. So how does journalism become part of the solution? Um, before we talk about how journalism can become part of the solution, um, here also a statistic that was done in August, um, especially if we would like to attract a young audience between 16 and 24, uh, this audience believes that influencers, content creators on Instagram are the most genuine followed by TikTok, uh, followed by they're all the same, but less and less young people are following uh, media or social, uh, sorry, platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Clubhouse, it was a thing a few months ago, <laughs> and no one ever heard of it. I don't know if you guys use Clubhouse. I myself was there, I think like for two weeks. And after a while I thought like, 
no, it's actually not adding any value. So people are craving for added value. How do you have added value? Well, solution journalism is probably one thing. And I will share here an example from Deutsche Welle. The first example is in Spanish. Don't uh, be afraid. For those who don't speak Spanish, I will translate it for you afterwards. So let's watch together the video. Estamos acostumbrados a producir para consumir y desechar. Nos compramos un pantalón y cuando se rompe, a la basura. Así hemos llegado al punto de llenar la naturaleza de desechos. La economía circular propone darle la vuelta a este sistema. Una empresa de mi barrio podría aprovechar el pantalón para hacer, no sé, una bolsa de los recados o un cojín nuevo. ¿Las ventajas? Primero, lo que se ahorra en reciclar. Segundo, los puestos de trabajo que se crearían. Y finalmente, cuidar el planeta. So this great video was done by our colleagues from the Spanish department. And uh, our colleague Enrique is here talking about how a fast fashion can probably be changed into other products. So it's up to the companies to realize that fast fashion, okay, is more affordable for young people. And this is probably the reason why they're consuming it more and more. But at the same time, they should think more sustainable and probably also think what they could do out of the fabrics that we were produced and try to save money, try to provide additional jobs, try to have a circulation there to be more sustainable. So here it's about a mixture about economy and sustainability and this topics in general for us as Deutsche Welle on social media, especially on Instagram reels work the best. Then I have another example here. So same thing here, it's talking about the festi uh, festival and rather speaking about the festival and who was playing there, who was participating, whatever, they are worried about the trash that is left behind by the um, attendees. So what about the tents? What about all the other stuff that as you see there, it's like an entire field um, where people have to think about what to do with this left behinds, leftovers uh, from the people. And there were a lot of projects afterwards that were recycling these tents into uh, backpacks, into um, uh, shoppers so that you could go and shop and whatever. So try to also have another perspective on topics rather than reporting about an event as huge as this music festival in the UK, and rather than think about what else might be more interesting, what else might be adding value in the end of the day for our audiences. And another opportunity to be part as journalist of the uh, solution is having explainers. Explainers work on TikTok great. And we as Deutsche Welle have TikTok appearances as well. So here, one example from our colleagues in Lagos. What is the cost of malaria in the first place? A great question from one of our followers. We're going to answer now. The serious and sometimes fatal disease humans call malaria is caused by one of me, the plasmodium parasite. But we don't walk alone. Hey guys, you know, right? The human blood scene always. If I'm carrying the parasite and I bite an infected person, about one week later, when I take my next blood meal, the plasmodium mixes with my saliva and is injected into the next person eating. And then if I sweat to me, invading my using as some sort of shield to evade the human body's own immune defenses. This means sheep are meddling with red blood cells, which are super important for bringing oxygen to the tissues in your body. It's what causes fatigue, fever, and neurological symptoms characteristics of malaria. 
So here What's you have a great example from the colleagues in, in um, Lagos. My, Sorry. What is the cost of my... Here the question, a, a user asked, what's the cause of malaria? So how does it start? Uh, and this is a great opportunity here to explain to your audience how malaria is transmitted in this case. And one last example, in Berlin, 76 years after the Holocaust, means confronting history every day. Walking around my neighborhood, I step over these little brass plaques. Each one marks a victim of the Holocaust who once lived or worked at this very address. You can read the person's name, date of birth, and their ultimate fate. They're called Stolpersteine. They're a reminder under our feet that real people were taken from the same places we live today. The artist who started the project has laid over 80,000 of them in Germany and across Europe, making them the world's largest decentralized memorial in jewish in berlin so our dear colleague uh from berlin fresh is uh, american jew and he's living in berlin and for a lot of american jews berlin is a very special place especially uh those who had um ancestors uh, from germany and having this stumbling stone Stolpersteine, reminds them uh, of what happened and i think that a lot of tourists who probably are stepping around in berlin or in other Ger big german cities don't really understand what this is but this is a great opportunity to show from a perspective of uh, someone who's affected directly by that, what this is and um, what it represents. So solution journalism, solution journalism, I think is one of the uh, primary solutions to give you the opportunity as a journalist to overcome the uh, negativity on social media, the negativity of reception, if you package the product, your news piece, in a way that your audience will interact with you, that your audience will find appealing. So to sum up, it's all about personality, it's all about infotainment, and it's all about finding yourself a niche. If you follow our, in, uh, our TikTok channels, for, for instance, you will see that Berlin Fresh cannot be compared to DW Lagos. Uh, you will see that DW Nasia on Instagram is doing something totally different than, for instance, DW News. So it's really worth to follow um, different accounts from different outlets. And I'm not only advertising our own, which would be great if you would follow us uh, by the end of the session. But regardless, I think think that for you as a journalist to take back home, finding yourself a personality, infotainment videos, and a niche is the key to success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yasmina. Thank you also for being honest with saying that journalism can be a part of a problem, <laughs> but we can also be a part of a solution. We'll get to that later on the question, okay? On the question and answer session. So um, let's move on to our third speaker is Dr. Letuma. She's a lecturer of journalism at the Ho Chi Minh National Academy of Politics in Hanoi, Vietnam, and an associate lecturer for the Academy of Journalism and Communication at Swinburne University in Vietnam. She earned her PhD in journalism from Monash University and gained global media experience from several countries. And Dr. Latuma's focus of research is using digital media for social movement and public sphere in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Besides academia, Dr. Latuma also works as a communication consultant for government relations and a collaborating writer for some media outlets. So for Dr. Latuma, the screen is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, so now I will share my screen with you. No. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes, Dr. Latuma. Okay, so Yes, um, this is me. Thank you for inviting me to speak in the digital discourse uh, series. And um, I'm glad to join you today. My name is Tu, 
and um, teaching journalism and communication in Hanoi, Vietnam. My academic background is in journalism and communication management. And I've been to your places in Bonn in 2015 and in Jakarta in 2018. This is my country, Vietnam, a country in the Southeast Asia. Its population is 97 million, 98 million, and the area is slightly smaller than Germany. This is a single party country ruled by the Communist Party of Vietnam. Some important milestones uh, of the country, uh, it gained the independence in the 1945, the country reunion in 1975, starting the economic reform or đổi mới, allowing multi players in the marketing uh, in the market to enter the market from the 1986 and the internet entered Vietnam in 1997 and today the average income of a Vietnamese person is about $2,700 per year compared to nearly starvation before the economic reform. We have more mobile phone than people. Uh, above 150 million mobile phones for 97 million people. So this is a market for cheap smartphones. And we have more social media accounts than the number um, of people using internet. The number of social media accounts is equal to 73.7% um, of the population. So this is the market for social media on smartphone. This photo is taken earlier this month uh, on the morning when the lockdown ended in Hanoi and um, the shop can sell the print newspaper again on street. And here people stay at the shop to use their smartphones. We are in the unique system of the state owned and state-run journalism, where the journalists and the government owned and control all newspapers. 41,000 of journalists are working here in Vietnam, and 21,000 of them have breast cards. Breast cards allows journalists to attend press conferences of the party and the government and interview governmental officers. Party first ideology means that journalism is expected to provide the contents about the good things, the positivity, the good example, achievements, agreements to bring the sense of safe and stability for more investment on doing the business and believe in the future of socialism. Meanwhile, on social media, the content is everything generated by the user without the professionalism. Why the contents on the journalism is to reinforce the existing vertical top-down power structure. On social media, everyone is friend and the power structure is not uh, vertical, but is horizontal. More and more new laws are being introduced to regulate the use of social media. Social media is a new space for the content about the bad criticism, complaints, failure, and negativity, because it is not governed by the same legislative framework and ideology that applies to journalism. People, spend, people are spending more time for social media than for reading online and printed journalism. As you see here, people are use, uh, uh, the time they spend using social media is two hours, 21 minutes, but the time spending for reading media, both online and printed newspaper is one hour and 
uh, 57 minutes. And uh, more people are watching live sessions on Facebook than the number of audience uh, of mainstream broadcasting. So you see here over 200, uh, 200,000 people watching the live stream program on Facebook. And uh, more and more journalists are leaving the professional journalism to become social media influencers. Even worse, they don't leave, but they work for both journalism and being paid social media influencer. Payment for them is from both sources, from journalism and from the companies and the branch. Journalists even organize groups to write for business and post on their social media accounts. They use the reputation, the fame, the position, the social capital they have, they earn from journalism to serve the commercial purposes on social media. Astroturfing, astroturfing occurs when uh, people try to make fake uh, supports uh, of the masses, of the massive. Social media farm is a new phenomenon where people grow automatic live view followers and interaction on social media. Um, oh, my conclusion is journalism is struggling against social media in terms of time of consumption, number of audience, and the move uh, of the skillful journalists from journalism to social media platform. But the social media itself is so easy to be manipulated and deteriorated. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to having your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Latuma. With an interesting question at the end, is there a journalism at all? Let's get to that later on the question and answer session. And uh, now let's move on to our uh, fourth speaker, uh, Sophia Smith Geller uh, is a multi award winning senior news reporter for Vice World News. She has pioneered how TikTok can be used as a news gathering and publishing tool for journalists and was the first journalist to have been selected for TikTok Creator Council. She has been broken uh, stories on the misuse of influencer advertising for political gain, Donald Trump's TikTok campaigning, despite simultaneously trying to ban the app, and how the anti-vaxxers have gamed the algorithm and how moderated TikTok ads have sold everything from loving gas to fake diet products through fraudulent use of the videos by Bonavid doctors. Harper Collins will publish her first book, Losing It, Sex Education for the 21st Century next April. So for Sophia, the screen is yours. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. It's the first time I've appeared virtually uh, in Indonesia, so it's very exciting for me. I've never been, but hopefully one day um, I can come and see you face to face. Let me just get my presentation up for you all. Here we go. Can you all see this okay? Yes, we can see it clearly. Brilliant. I'll get started then. So I am one of the world's only journalists who use TikTok as a means of both news gathering and publishing. So you will find a number of probably existing traditional media outlets who may have explored social media and they may have their own TikTok channel. Um, I'm different in that I've set it up sort of personally and um, it's, it's become almost like a personal social media brand that I've been able to take from job to job. And that has gotten me a ton of stories, but also a, quite a significant audience. So a bit about me, um, I'm a sen senior news reporter at Vice World News. Vice are one of the world's uh, leading youth media brands and World News is one of their one of their growing media arms, does what it says on the tin. Uh, it's our World News Network and we have a number of bureaus around the world. I am based in London, where I'm from. 
however, on top of that, my day job, I am a TikToker. I have 200 and I think 82 or 3,000 followers now. Um, that shows you how quickly my uh, an audience can grow because I changed that number, I think, a day ago. Um, and I am very fortunate in that in my TikToking here in the UK, I've basically been noticed by TikTok. Um, and they selected me in 2020 as one of the top 100 creators in the country. Uh, they selected me for the Creator Council, where I had an opportunity to speak to the app directly about, um, you know, my my positives and negatives about the app. Um, and yeah, I have my first book out next April. Um, and I think a lot of these things, my new job at Vice, uh, my book, a lot of these things wouldn't have happened had I not built my profile using social media. This is my TikTok journey. And before I explain it, TikTok is one of my tools. I am also on Reddit. I also use Facebook groups. I also use Instagram and Twitter. Um, so I really have a whole ecosystem of social media that I use to find stories and kind of penetrate online communities to find things that are interesting, can be interesting to my audience. Um, I am about four and a half years into my journalism career and I began as a BBC video journalist in the top left. Um, and it was while I was a video journalist that musically the app transformed into TikTok. And I saw that people were talking about it and I thought, oh, there might come a point where I have to cut videos for TikTok because I'm already cutting BBC videos for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I better work out how TikTok works just in case. Uh, I started making a few videos and instantly started going viral. My first video had over, uh, I think, 150,000 views. I got 1,400 followers overnight. And it was the kind of growth that I'd never seen with any other app I had been on. And obviously that was intriguing. So I kept experimenting. Um, and it was while I was a BBC journalist that I, I kept going viral. Um, and this was all content that I was making on my personal TikTok, uh, um, sometimes about journalism, but also about my personal passions. So my personal interests in things like languages and music, I would do explainers or make content around them as well. So it wasn't limited to like my journalistic output. For me, it really just became like a place of self-expression. And one of those things I, you know, express about is my job. Um, I then start gaining a significant following on TikTok. And um, I find it becomes almost a full time job on top of my day job as a journalist at the BBC. I was not allowed at the BBC to put my journalism on TikTok. Uh, that's just a weird arbitrary rule someone gave me. It's not the same rule for other journalists at the BBC. Don't know what happened to me. Um, but essentially, that's why I came up with a very kind of full and broad strategy on there um, that wouldn't interfere with my day job. And it started bringing me stories. People would start contacting me because I was basically one of the only journalists they knew um, or maybe one of the only journalists that they thought would care if they DM'd to say, hey, this thing's happening to me, can you cover it? Um, and as a result, I've been able to cover stories that way. And secondly, um, I was also able to find stories, um, as you said earlier, about the US election, but all because I was spending a lot of time on TikTok. I um, kept doing all of that. And then I'm very lucky that another opportunity came my way and I'm now a senior news reporter at Vice and they are very supportive of my TikTok journalism. And as a result, my, I, I can already see my audience has grown sort of quite significantly. But if I do a story for Vice and I think my audience on TikTok will like it, I will turn the Vice story into a TikTok where I speak directly straight to camera to the audience and I say, hey, I, 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 give, I give like the title and then I explain, hey, I'm a senior news reporter at Vice and I've been covering this this week. And those videos will maybe reach my following. But the exciting thing about TikTok and the For You page is that my videos can reach people who do not follow me, who perhaps don't day to day encounter Vice journalism, but they will as a result because I've used TikTok as, as the bridge between us. Um, and I've done a number of, report, a number of reports that there about TikTok as well. Um, a couple of facts. Um, obviously, I am based in London and there's over 100 million TikTok users here in the UK, um, in Europe, 
Um, but a fact that always really interests me is that generally speaking about TikTok, only, um, only all, not 91, 9% of TikTok users create content, 91% are lurkers. So if you make content on TikTok, you're, you're unique, basically. Um, an awful, uh, a significant number of people on there are on there to consume content, not create it. This is just a little sample of all the different kinds of work um, that I have done uh, in mixed of things I did while I was a BBC World Service journalist and also now as a senior news reporter at Vice. Um, I've been able to bring in a ton of a uh, ton of stories not covered anywhere else which are really relevant to younger audiences and for both organizations reaching out to more young people is like ex existential for both of them. So I'm really proud of uh, these stories that I've been able to do and as you can see from here um, I delivered all of these stories um, often not only on TikTok itself, but I would deliver the stories across television, radio, uh, and online text. I thought I would take you through a couple of TikToks that I did. Um, I don't have like a, a kind of regular or hard and fast strategy. I just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, even lately, I wrote a poem, a, a spoken word poem, um, and that has gone really viral in a way that spoken word poems wouldn't necessarily go viral on other, other platforms um, the other day. And that's why my audience has grown at, at about, by about 5,000 people in the last week. But um, this is my most famous video. I made a sung news explainer about the ever given ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal. Um, I combined two memes that were happening at the same time, the meme of the, of the sea shanty and the meme of the, of the ever given ship. And um, I, the TikTok all in all took about two hours to make um, from ideation to publication. And uh, as you can see from the numbers there, I mean, 3.6 million views, 24,000 people shared it. Um, I got 20,000 new followers. I got recognized in all the major places that talk about journalism innovation as an innovator. Um, I've actually also recently been shortlisted as innovation of the year at the British Journalism Awards as well for my TikToks. And the Suez Canal Sea Shanty is a big part probably of why I've been shortlisted. Um, I got on, I was on the front page of Egypt's most read newspaper. I was on like breakfast radio here in the UK, it was mad. Um, this is a social campaign that I ran around the TikTok documentary, which was a documentary that I made about TikTok's influence on the US election. I made a number of different TikToks for that. Um, and overall, the number of TikToks I made not only got over 250,000 views, but got a lot of new listeners who would then message me telling me that they listened to my documentary. So for me, it was a really good example of like conversion of people who encounter my social media to to, to consumers of my journalistic content and not just my TikToks. Um, but this was a kind of spoken word rap in the style of one of the contributors who contributed to the documentary. Um, and what is really exciting is that these videos hit the US audience via the For You page. Um, obviously I'm British, my audience was at the time primarily British, but um, because it was about the US and I was all constantly interacting with US users up until the documentary came out, this hitting the US for you page meant that it got to the audience for which, you know, it was most necessary, the audience who was voting in the election. So I'm really proud of that. And then there are some TikToks I make where it's not about my own content per se. I find content that I think is really interesting online um, like, like I'm sure you all do every day, you, like, you see an interesting tweet and you might send it to a friend. Um, I, I kind of, this is an equivalent of almost maybe, a, a, this is like a TikTok retweet, but this, this passage was going viral on Twitter and I found it fascinating. And I was like, wow, yeah, this is so interesting. It's really made me think. That is a TikTok. Like I just, I just took it and I took that experience of, wow, I read this cool thing and it really made me think. And I share that with my audience. Um, and my audience also think, yeah, oh my God, yeah, that does really make you think. Um, and all I am is like the vehicle of how they get that information. 
Um, and that was a video that did really well as well. As you can see, it got um, 676,000 views, 190K likes. Um, I have a very healthy follower to like ratio on TikTok as well, if you, if you had there, which I'm really proud of. Um, but this is good for me because I'm, I have a book out next year, which is, um, it has a, like a significant focus on women's health and rights. And being able to make content like this every now and again, I'm growing awareness in my audience that this is something that I really um, care about and talk about, which I may not cover day to day in my journalism. So it's a really good way of growing audience awareness in, in an area of coverage you'd like to do more. Um, the reality of being a TikTok journalist, daily output and planning, minimum two to three hours a day of work, um, it is very time consuming. I'm constantly either watching stuff or engaging with people in comments. Um, and that's completely separate to actually ideating and, and making TikToks. Um, I would say that I can make TikToks very quickly now because I've been doing it for two years um, and that I script every TikTok pretty much that I make, which means that once you do the research, the scripting, it becomes quite an efficient process. Um, but obviously I know how to script from being a video and television journalist. Um, so there's quite, I have been able to draw from my traditional broadcast skills to uh, make good TikToks, I hope. Um, and there is a lot of like mindful curation of the For You page that you need to do if you want to find certain stories. I've, I do sometimes have people say to me, how do you find stories? And my For You page is just babies dancing. And I say to them, well, if your For You page is babies dancing, that's because you're telling TikTok that you like that content. You're obviously sat there, you know, you're not skipping the videos. You're sat there, you know, having a good laugh, having a good time. And that's great. And my For You page isn't all, you know, scintillating fascinating content that are possible stories my for you page is full of fun it's full of humor um but full of serious stuff as well and um a really international i have an international diet i think which i'm really happy with um i'd also add that there is a loss of privacy i do get recognized um quite a lot now um walking around um i covered cop 26 and I got recognized so many times by like really different diverse members of the public including young women in to um, an Egyptian political official who must have probably recognized me from the Suez Canal thing um, to a Glaswegian security guard. Um, and it, it's nuts that TikTok has given me that reach, um, but it, it can come at a cost. I have once been followed home in it, uh, by a sort of an over eager fan, not by someone who was, you know, mean or anything. Um, but, it, you know, it does make you think, OK, it, it does come at a cost of privacy. And that's why I would say that TikTok isn't for everyone. Um, if you have dependents, if you don't have the time on top of your day job to spend scrolling through stuff, you know, um, maybe it's worth thinking how you can use it simply as a news gathering tool, rather as both news gathering and publishing and acknowledge that because it's really difficult to actually search through the platform is probably quite unlikely um, to grow an audience on that. It's all about figuring out how you can make it work for you. And that's not only good advice for TikTok, that's good advice for any social media app that you wanna, you wanna take part in. You figure out what it is that you want it to serve in your life and you let it do that. It may, if you want it to help you grow like a big audience, yeah, you can do that. It will take a lot of work or you may want to just use it for news gathering, as I said. Um, this is me uh, earlier this year giving a panel at TikTok, um, at TikTok's one of their London festivals. Um, and I really like this picture because I'm sat between like two people who are way younger than me. Um, re they're really talented content creators. They have an enormous, they have huge followings, far bigger than mine. And the fact that like a journalist was up there sitting alongside them. Um, it, it's just something I haven't seen before. And I was really, I'm really proud that I, I think I'm pioneering how um, sort of journalists can also be content creators and how that's, that's really healthy for our industry that we do that and we foster these relationships online with young people. 
Um, so yeah, that is me. Um, I'm on Twitter and in, I'm very active on Twitter and Instagram. And those are the places that I most often share my work and my thoughts about journalism and innovation. So please follow me there if you like to chat about that. And if you want to see, you know, if you want to see the performances, um, you can head to Sophia Smith Gala, um, where I am on TikTok. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, for enlightening and also entertaining presentation. And that presentation was at the same time ending our uh, presentation session from our speakers. And now let's move on to the question and answer session. We have received um, several questions from our participants and this was all an interesting questions. But before that, um, let me ask my personal uh, questions to Sophia. You know, I will present my personal questions. Um, like, do you believe social networking uh, made your job harder, you know, by having to juggle um, journalistic duties with also maintaining TikTok or Facebook, you mentioned earlier, you know, and deleting unwanted comments, maybe, or uh, potential lawsuits. So, but, but, uh, before that, do you delete unwanted comments or what is the policy there? I, on TikTok, if I, if something I believe is hurtful or it's sharing something that's not true, um, you know, spreading misinformation, I will delete it pretty much straight away. And sometimes I see a comment that it might not be directly harmful to me, but it might be someone kind of saying something nasty back to another user. Um, and obviously I don't need my comment sections to become those kind of places for people who, who've come there to enjoy my content. Um, so I'm quite protective of, of my commenters as well as protective of myself. But um, social media has made my job way easier. Um, it's how I find stories. Uh, I, I entered the journalism industry without any contacts. So like in terms of networking for my own career, as well as um, finding stories, because I, I don't necessarily have contacts in sort of powerful places, as it were. Um, it's been really, really useful for me and it's helped me. It's helped me always have a, a flow of content to report on and talk about. Um, so, and I think I would also add that I, I grew up in the in social media um, and I do think that makes a difference in that I can't imagine a life not using it um, and and my my whole kind of social life is built around it so it's quite um, everything is very fluid and feels very natural um, so it, it I, I can't say it ever really feels like hard work it just feels like my normal life Okay, so we received a lot of questions about TikTok. Um, let me pick one, it's from Arina Mustafa. So she asked to Sophia Smith-Geller, how do you make sure that your contents are catered to TikTok viewers, mainly teens and young adults, basically how you make it fun and digestible without taking it out of context? I think um, you've also, you've kind of answered your own question. Um, so you obviously understand what's needed, but, um, you can't make a TikTok like you would make a television package. Um, you, the best content creators are very relatable. They inject a bit of humor um, equally. Make, humor is perhaps not even the right word. It's like emotion. Um, it's news. You can add emotion to kind of objective news, especially if, I mean, sometimes like some of the reporting and stories I do about violence against women, um, yeah, I don't need to give that TikTok in, in a sterile fashion as if I've never thought about or have feelings about violence against women. Yeah, I can be on a level with my audience and make, you know, be amongst them in my anger kind of thing. Um, and that's something that I can do in, in the job that in the job that I have at the moment. Um, I would also say that TikTok offers a lot of cool opportunities about in-app shooting and editing so a lot a big feature of my videos is I use the crash zoom so there's a lot of movement in my videos even though I'm just sat in one place or stood in one place uh, and the opportunity to like handily put music in as someone who's made sort of proper video packages you know videos for social media channels at the BBC it's to make a TikTok is a far it's a kind of more gritty rough and ready process but as a result it looks like the kind of thing that your audience can, could almost make you know it's not it's not worlds apart from it and that helps it look like a relatable uh, interesting product for them 
Mm. And how do we identify TikTok journalism and how do we set them apart from regular TikTok creators? The questions from Sita Dewi. You shouldn't. You shouldn't be able to tell them apart. Um, the only way, the only difference is that I think my audience would know that I look into certain things or um, I think I've built a rapport of, of trust. So I feel like um, the only difference would be that like I sort of suggested earlier, if, if something was happening, um, so it does happen quite a lot where someone makes a TikTok about something bad happening in their life and that TikTok goes viral and I will get tagged in it loads because people are like, oh my God, like this, this shouldn't be happening. Sophia, can you do something about it? Um, and obviously, and that, that there's a reason they're not tagging other creators per se. Um, so that's the only difference. Otherwise, I am a content creator just like the rest of them. Hmm. Okay. May I so, add something? <laughs> sure, Yasmina. Sorry, Sophia. Uh, I disagree here a little bit because in terms of journalism, you should always be able to tell people apart, to know that this is a content creator, to know that this is the personal view of uh, a journalist, and to know that this is a public broadcaster. I think that this is key to avoid misunderstanding and to avoid certain situations and countries that might lead to a huge outrage or even to lynching certain people. So coming from uh, the house of Deutsche Welle and having had experience like that, we have a policy where people have to identify themselves as, um, like, for instance, Prita is now our correspondent. She's present on Instagram, and her Instagram is her personal account, and she's doing her personal stories there. And I think that this is very important to um, also keep the trust of the users in journalism and in activism, because I think that what a lot of journalists do, and I think that this is what also one of the speakers in our um, session said, that you should also be able to identify that the journalist is actually getting paid for that or the journalist is actually doing it out of activism i think that there's a difference i mean it's super obvious on my tiktok i'm a journalist because it says the minute someone goes in my bio it says i'm a vice world news reporter um so it's not it's no secret to my audience that i am a journalist um i would caveat that i don't know any journalist who doesn't isn't upfront about it all of the tiktok journalists i know it says in all their bios that they're a journalist um, what I meant more is that our content in terms of, um, in terms of how good the content is, it should be on a par with content creators so that it doesn't look like we're some kind of, um, patrician out of touch, uh, you know, reporter. So by appearing on a, like official account, like we identify ourselves as journalists, but we also have to identify ourselves as a journalist on our personal account. That's what you mean, Yasmina. Yeah, so I've never worked for an organization where um, I, I wouldn't be allowed to have a personal account per se. Like whatever I do on social media um, is considered, you know, the view of a journalist who works at X organization. Um, so Whatever I do, I'm always representing my employer. But here, here lies the difference. We have uh, professional accounts that are also curated by a social media team. And they're obvious to the outside world. And then we have then uh, journalists who have their own private accounts. So I think that this is main, uh, very important so that people don't attach your own personal view to the entire um, broadcaster that you're working for, because this might happen. Anything you'd like to add, Sophia? Yeah, like um, you would, if you if you made a personal view on a personal account at the BBC, you would get fired by the BBC. Um, there's that in certainly in like the broadcasting arena in the UK. There's no such thing as, as a personal account in that way for journalists. Can we add the Deutsche Welle Yasmina share our personal thoughts? Um, you know. Um, is it like allowed from Deutsche Welle, like let's say me as a journalist, but I'm sharing my personal thought on the certain issues? 
Sure, we have a lot of colleagues in the house who share their own personal views on certain topics, but they make it very clear to the outside world that this is their own private account, that this is their own private opinion, and this is not attached to the Deutsche Welle in general. Something else that we have also at Deutsche Welle is people who express their opinion on certain topics and have um, and can be considered activists are not allowed to write pieces on this topic. Like for instance, me, I advocate for certain topics, <laughs> minorities in the Middle East. So I'm not allowed to write a report about minorities in the Middle East because then I wouldn't be um, objective. Okay. So um, while you're here, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, we are now, you know, we, we kind of stopped listening to our audience. So do you think like the control has shifted more towards the consumer, let's say on this, the audience since the rise of social media, Yasmina? Yeah, and I think that this is important. I mean, there are not only algorithms out there that you have to focus on and to consider once you produce the content, but also listening to your audience. I mean, we're sitting mainly in Bonn and in Berlin as Deutsche Welle, but we would like to uh, attract our viewers, listeners across the world. We have sometimes the lucky situation to have people locally like you, but sometimes we don't. So we have to listen to our audience to be able to understand what they're actually asking for and to, what they're demanding for so that we can stand out from the crowd out there because we have also then people like Sofia we have to compete with. And uh, this would be the, our only opportunity to be still listened to and taken serious and not only like brushed off, oh yeah, this is the old tradition, uh, white haired uh, public broadcaster. Uh, I won't listen to them because obviously they're not providing uh, the content that I would like to. I think that this is also the key to the success of uh, AJ Plus, Vice, BuzzFeed, because they impackage the content in a way, uh, the co their content in a way where uh, audiences interact more with them. This is what we're be, uh, we've been trying as well. Okay, let's continue to um, the questions from participants. To Imam Safini, um, what are the challenges in running a homeless media since Rupa Data is a running in social media only? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the challenges, uh, the main challenge actually, uh, since we only have social media channel to uh, to, 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 to distribute uh, our products is that uh, we have limited option uh, to uh, to have our our contents or our um, our products uh, seen by the people, uh, but. Uh, we understand that uh, clearly that uh, uh, let's say this Instagram uh, is our only uh, hope, is our only way uh, to be known by the people. So that uh, we we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, make sure that this is something that uh, people will uh, will will see uh, instead of uh, other other uh, other Instagram accounts. Uh, so that uh, we make, we make some. Uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, some some um, something that that, uh, that can make people uh, relate this to us. So for example, the, the identity, the, the the color identity, uh, the the branding, uh, the, uh, the 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 copywriting. Uh, we we make this uh, to make sure that uh, this can be associated with uh, with Rupa Data. But yes, uh, I I I agree that this is a challenge that we only have one uh, one channel. Uh, I I I I have. I have the plan that in the future we will we will have uh, our own uh, our own channels as well. Uh, but uh, at the time being, with our current resources, uh, I think this is also uh, an opportunity for us to focus on our uh, Instagram account uh, to uh, to improve it from day to day. I think uh, that's from my perspective. So you on Rupa Data, you don't rely on the you know the the speed or the fast when the information can, but you rely on that data accuracy. So how do you, um, you know, make sure that the audience can get the attention, you know, how do you believe that Rupa Data can get, you know, attention from our, from your audience? <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, I, I sometimes also, also rely on uh, the speed, um, but um, yeah, this is also, also one of my, uh, my weaknesses at this point that uh, we, we, we cannot uh, always uh, follow the speed of the of the of the uh, news or um, or the updates uh, throughout the uh, throughout the the day. Uh, but uh, 
I usually uh, make some uh, mapping uh, or, or or some uh, forecast uh, that uh, in terms of uh, policies, uh, public policies, uh, uh, it is usually on on this week or or on the next week that that may may uh, th that may happen some uh, something uh, related to uh, let's say, let's say the the uh, the COVID nineteen university. Uh, so that's uh, um, I'm making sure that. Uh, First, this has to be accurate. Uh, it has to be uh, presented uh, well and easy to digest. Uh, uh, you know that um, some of the uh, government uh, policies and regulations are are, are really uh, long long, uh, long document that people uh, uh, people find so it, it, it has lots of uh, lots of text and so on. And um, uh, we use this uh, this uh, this opportunity to to make to transform this into something that people uh, people want to. Want to see people want to uh, people are interested to uh, to access uh, visually interesting and it is just uh, at a one stop uh, one stop content that uh, you you don't you you don't even need to just slide or you don't even need to click uh, to get the uh, the the whole summary. I think uh, uh, that's what our strong point. Uh, Sometimes uh, the speed of the of the uh, of the issue, but uh, uh, we present it uh, for the people to easily uh, digest and easily to keep that as one of our strong strong points. Mm. I'm checking the the account right now, and you already have like forty nine thousand uh, followers on Rupa Data. Yes. And you just launched it like when when do you launch the account? Uh, April two thousand and twenty. It was first launched. It wasn't long ago, but you already have like uh, forty nine thousand. So, um, what do you think? Like, uh, what makes your Rupa Data account has a selling and strong uh, points to the the followers in the audience? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, th th this is still under under our analysis, but uh, our uh, initial finding is that. Um, if we oppose uh, either um, useful information or something uh, good news that has become uh, something that people want to see. Uh, for example, uh, um, when we post, uh, when, when it was also, it was also uh, a moment that I, I, can, I can catch that when the government announced that everybody can get vaccinated anywhere, regardless their uh, uh, their residential status, anywhere, and then I, I I made a list on what what are what uh, the places of uh, listed by the government uh, um, as the vaccination centers, uh, that became a really a really high engagement post, and uh, I. I it gave us an impression that if we if we share something that people need the information that people can use the information for for their benefit, it is something that we can engage better and better with uh, with with the people. And the other uh, the other case is about uh, the good news uh, when we uh, when we won uh, Indonesia won the gold medal for uh, badminton uh, women's double. This is the first time we won a, a women's double in badminton in in the Olympic. Uh, I made a. I watched uh, the the match uh, on TV, and I made a, I made a, I prepared uh, the the content even before the match. Uh, just in case we won, <laughs> and then we won, and then I instantly post uh, the uh, the uh, the infographic uh, telling about the, our our success stories uh, during the Olympic, and this is uh, the first time we we won the uh, women's double in badminton in the Olympic. And it, it was also one of our strongest uh, contents in social media. And, and it was uh, a finding that uh, good news is something that people is, uh, enjoy to consume. And we are also thankful that the COVID-19 situation in Indonesia is getting better uh, compared to, yeah, let's say, in, in July and August. And uh, we have the, the daily update of COVID-19 and the national COVID-19 daily update uh, based, on the, based on the data uh, released by the uh, the Minister of Health, Ministry of Health uh, every afternoon. And with the situation is getting better, 
uh, our engagement is also getting better because uh, people are happy to see our our uh, our updates that they say uh, they they see by themselves that it uh, it is declining it it's in a, a good trend it's promising that we are uh, recovering from uh, this pandemic and it brings hope and people are happy to see this kind of uh, contents that's interesting you try to attract audience uh, by you know providing them the, the current news that has been talking by people right Yes, uh, it is not only the current news, but also something that uh, people are happy to see and happy to share. Okay, thank you so much, Imam Safini, for answering the questions. And uh, let's move to Dr. Latuma. Dr. Latuma, can you uh, turn on the... Can you hear me yeah. now? Yes, I can hear you clearly yeah. now. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I got several questions uh, and some questions uh, from my emails um, in, into my email. So I will answer it first. Um, the question is, how do you feel about the regulation on social media and its uh, effects on journalism? So um, this is my answer. Regulations such as the cybersecurity law in Vietnam allows the authority to chase the users on the internet. And it is on one hand, it can reduce the number of opposite opinions. And so it's reduced the uh, formulation of the public sphere. But on the other hand, it can increase the quality of the opinions. People have to provide the real evidence and use the real name so they will be more responsible to what they post online. And uh, eventually it is good for the audience. Uh, so that is the first question. The second question I see here in the global chat box is, um, is there any uh, um, code of ethics for journalists using social media? Uh, and um, it, yes, um, last year, April last year, the uh, Vietnam Journalist Association, they issued the um, code of conduct for journalists using social media. Um, but it is not in detail. So um, provided that the journalist doesn't um, violate um, any law uh, and the journalist um, use the ideology or the principle of uh, party first and do no harm to the party, then then they can tolerate the use of social um, policy advocacy and lobby. And if so, some Vietnamese journalists um, follow this um, program today, or they may watch it later, they may find an argument that at daytime they are journalists, at night time they can be the Facebook influencer, for example. And, and um, in my opinion, is not uh, acceptable at all. But um, in the practice, is the reality now that people work both for the mainstream media and they also run for the social media account of themselves. But I think as long as they can um, build the uh, evidence of the, the audience, they can attract the audience for the um, media product. On the, uh, the journalism question, From, okay, from uh, Arena. And later continue to answer the questions from the participants. And now we have a questions um, to all the speakers um, that, that asked, in the digital age, should the media newsroom increase the number of employees working in the social media to provide news to the audience? Maybe uh, Yasmin, I can answer first. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that again? <laughs> sure. Um, 
she asked that in the digital age, should the media newsroom increase the number of employees working on the social media to provide news to the audience? Sure. Sure, I would say definitely sure, uh, but also with different roles. So uh, it would be great if we, uh, as, as a broadcast or whatever, you would have someone in the team who could keep an eye on data so that you would work and optimize your appearance according to the data that you see. Uh, then it would be great if you could have someone who is providing the content and in the team, obviously, you would need someone who can write, take pictures, uh, videos, whatever, uh, someone who stands in front of the camera, uh, who has the personality to stand in front of the camera, and obviously a community manager. Community management is key. So you could produce less content if you focus more and more on the community management, because people want to talk. Listening to the audience, what I've been saying over and over again, um, listening to the audience is uh, very important so that they feel taken for serious at the same time you can take it as a source to get inspired for new topics. So community management, yes, someone for the production of content and someone to keep an eye on the data to be able to work data-based. Okay, Sophia, you can continue. I'm sorry, Sophia, we can't hear yeah, you. That, yeah, um, that. Oh, there's a delay, okay. Certainly, certainly in my experience of, um, my own experience working for different organizations, but also my peers who work in social media, here in the UK, it's two things happen a lot with social media journalists. One is that in the newsroom, they're often siloed and they aren't being integrated um, by like the more traditional areas of the newsroom because some people still don't understand how important social media is and how much social media producers need to be involved in conversations. And the other thing is that there can be a ceiling really early on. I remember in the first team I was in where I was a social media producer, there was no step up for me at all. Um, I joined that team and then once I, I felt like I had grown as much as I could grow in that team. I, I was back to square one again, figuring out where I could next go. And I think what newsrooms should work to do to encourage more people to enter this area is to provide very healthy growth opportunities and also a sense of kind of the si healthy sidestepping as well. The idea that someone who perhaps has traditionally worked in radio can quite natively pick up digital skills and go back to radio and bring those skills. Um, I, I find actually it's a very limiting area of the newsroom in terms of growing a career. Okay, thank you so much, Mas. Imam, do you wanna add something? Yeah, I think it, it is also a yes from my side because uh, uh, yeah, um, both social media and, and, and journalism uh, needs to be considered each other. Uh, when we do when we do social media, uh, we need to uh, we need to see uh, I, 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 I cannot mention uh, whose sport it is, it is, but uh, uh, it is it is said that uh, if we share, we need to make sure If it's true, if it's necessary, and if it's kind and, uh, in doing so, social media, I think uh, the journalism uh, can be uh, uh, the shareability of our the uh, publication that, uh, that, that that we broadcast. Uh, but it is also, to, uh, as mentioned by Yasmina earlier, that uh, it is also important to find some uh, some inspirations or some ideas for uh, for our journalistic works. I think uh, that's from my side. Okay, but what if, you know, for a certain media, if they can add, you know, let's say they cannot add employees or they cannot add another team, should we be forced to like familiar to social media? Because I myself, I have no problem with, you know, social media or TikTok and stuff. But what if for someone that is not, you know, don't like to be in front of the camera and stuff, like, do you think should we be forced to familiar with that? <laughs> be forced? Uh, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't think we have to be forced. But uh, uh, 
the familiarity or uh, the 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 understanding of of both social media and journalistic, I think uh, that's important. It it can be, uh, yeah, it, it can be fulfilled not not by uh, not only by forcing people to yeah to have that that, that way, but uh, we can also learn in many ways. For example, uh, 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 like what was Sophia earlier uh, presented, I think uh, this this also gave us uh, some some perspective on on how a, a journalist can have the, the perspective of social media and and how a content creator can have the perspective of of, of journalists. Uh, I think uh, it is all about perspective, and we cannot force people uh, on on their uh, their resources. So for Mas Imam, you won't force someone to the like, if they don't like to be on a camera, you don't, you don't want to force someone. <laughs> I think uh, uh, whatever on air has to be genuine. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm not forcing, uh, I'm not in the position of forcing somebody, uh, but yes, uh, in, in terms of understanding, uh, I will be uh, uh, a bit of forcing, uh, let's say, my team. <laughs> yes, Mina, will you force someone to be to do that when they don't like or they don't familiar with that? Obviously, um, not. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not, but I would, as Sophia no. mentioned earlier, provide the opportunities for so. I mean, I think that a lot of people might be afraid to stand in front of the camera, but once they've tried it, they lose the fear. I mean, especially on social media, it's not like you have to stand around in front of a big audience. Uh, you can be in your own living room, in your own office, and have your ring light and attach your mobile device and dance around in your own living room and have your safe space. And at the same time, you're broadcasting it afterwards. So you're still uh, able to edit it. You're still able to change some things that you're not happy with. And some Simply try it. A lot of people uh, whom I give trainings to, they say, oh, no, I, I, I'm not the camera person. I would rather stand behind it. And once they try it, they see that it's actually not really that complicated and they get by time and time more comfortable. And uh, it's practice. It's all about practice. But yeah, obviously, in a social media team, there's so many roles. If people really think that... Um, they shouldn't be in front of the camera because they don't feel comfortable. There are so many other roles that they could fill in and still add value to the team. Okay, so we have a question that's similar to the topic from Trisha Dantianti. Um, she asks, like, uh, do you have any tips for uh, young journalists starting out as content creators that want to utilize their platforms to establish their social media presence as journalists? Someone wants to give the tips? I already gave three. <laughs> like find your niche, uh, infotainment factor, and uh, I forgot the third one. Ah, personality. There we have it. Personality. So yeah, these three tips and simply try it. Try to play along. Don't be ashamed if you commit mistakes. There are so many people out there who appreciate what you guys are doing. Don't take uh, negativity to personal. Uh, there are a lot of trolls out there who would be negative just for being negative, and they don't know you. It, it, just simply uh, take uh, the opinion of the people whom you appreciate for serious. Everything else, if people criticize you out there and you would like to try something, simply ignore it and take, as a, take it as an opportunity to grow. So Ms. Imam, are you used to being in the front of camera? Or are uh, you yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, once. <laughs> I used to be in front of the camera and, and uh, I felt that I'm not a camera person. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the I'm the person to show off my face uh, so often, and even when when I start Rupa Data, I I I I think that uh, it's time for me to be known uh, more more for my artworks uh, instead of my my myself. Uh, but then uh, one of my team members uh, rem uh, reminded me that uh, uh, at some point you have to show yourself, and this is also a, a challenge for me to speak like this. So I think. Uh, uh, my tips would be that uh, uh, find your uh, your strength. Uh, I think that uh, I, I have strength in, in analyzing uh, data and things and visualizing them, and I I, I focus on, on that strength. Uh, but then uh, it is uh, not 
it is not limited to to that uh, that point but uh, at some points you have to challenge yourself for example uh, uh, when, when when there's uh, an opportunity to uh, to speak or to do networking uh, that's also uh, what I have to challenge myself uh, because um, the world of digital era is evolving and uh, the platform or the let's say the, the social media account that we uh, that we initiate uh, is also uh, subject to evolution if, if it's not evolving then uh, it will stuck uh, like what I mentioned in, in my in my quest that uh, we, we, we keep uh, we have to keep inspiring or otherwise we, we will be ex expiring so I have my own personal questions um let me Okay, so social media makes it possible for them to find a much wider range of sources on demand. Um, to what extent do you believe social media has removed the barrier between journalists and the public? Jasmine, can you answer that? Well, I think um, during the past year, especially um, in the US, we have observed with the elections and what's happening, Black Lives Matter, Me Too movement, that um, people are taking certain topics more serious that they used to ignore formally. I mean, if it wouldn't be for the movement on social media for the Me Too, um, people wouldn't have spoken about this problem has been there for years and years and no one really took it for serious and important enough to be speaking about it's always like this incidence obviously this doesn't um, mean that um, certain incidents shouldn't be reported about but there are other topics that interest the audience out there as well black Lives matter uh, movement same thing if it wouldn't be for the media if it wouldn't be um for the activists behind it who really reported about it who published videos same thing middle east uh this the the revolution the the, the spring of the middle east with all the revo uh, revolutions in tunisia egypt libya whatever same thing if it wouldn't be for the public and later on picking up the media um people wouldn't have known about it and all the impact that it had Sorry, I have to unmute. Sorry, I have to mute myself because it's raining so hard. I'm afraid that it will. <laughs> uh, Nazimo, do you want to add something? Do you think like uh, the social media has removed the barrier between journalists and the public? Okay, uh, so uh, I, it is a yes from me uh, because I also experienced it. I, um, I left my job as a journalist uh, nine years ago already, but uh, when I when I start my own platform, I can uh, I can get uh, sufficient data, sufficient uh, statements, uh, sufficient information from, uh, from uh, to social media, and I'm full for that. Uh, as when when I when we when we wanted to uh, hear a, a statement from the president, we did so came to the palace and had the press pass of the presidential palace, and uh, it, it, it was limited to only a verified uh, media person. But but now it is uh, shared widely to the president's uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and any other social media, and it is trusted because it is coming from the president himself. And uh, I think this is. Uh, how the barrier between, between uh, the media and the, and the public is removed. Uh, just uh, not everyone is accessing that, uh, that information. So I can be the bridge between not accessing uh, uh, the information uh, to, uh, to the source persons uh, by uh, uh, developing my contents. So you believe that there is no barrier between the public and the journalists and you try to be like the bridge to both of uh, them? It is not uh, completely removed. Uh, there, there is still uh, some barriers, but uh, it is uh, much removed. It is, uh, it is uh, much more uh, blended between uh, public and journalists. I think. Okay, thank you, as Imam. So, Sophia, now you're back. So, can you hear me clearly, and can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, there's questions from our participants asking, like, do you have any tips? that you would give to young journalists starting out as content creators as someone who is used to being in front of camera? Um, I would just 
make sure you're on social media and get accounts and start making content don't only consume it make it yourself there's i got no social media training i learn it all myself um i think the technical training i had as a broadcaster helped um but um ultimately in terms of social stuff and social media resilience as well had to learn it all on the job um and the best way to learn is to do it what is the, the, the excitement you get from, you know, sharing content and makeup, providing content, and being in front of the camera to the audience? So, sorry, what was the first bit of that question? What is the excitement that you get? Um, I don't know. I just want my journalism to reach more people, basically. <laughs> that's just, that's, um, that's all it is. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, can Dr. Latuma hear me now? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Now the connection yeah. is better. So better there's, here. Yes. Yes, there's a yes. question that hasn't been answered. Do mm. alternative media get controlled by the government too in Vietnam? You mean the journalism is by the government or, or what? Uh, the media specifically. Ah. Um, I don't think I can listen to the question clearly. Um, but uh, what I can say is that the um, journalism system in Vietnam is unique in the way that is uh, sponsored, run, and controlled by the government for over. 70 years right until now and um, when we are in this area of the world southeast asia where we have the young population we have the um, a lot of um, um, affordable device for us to use to uh, to to use to enter social media and we have a lot of um, choice for the alternative media for example facebook or tiktok today we talk a lot about TikTok, um, I can see that there's a challenge for this um, particular system of journalism in order to both maintain their function as serving the, the government, serving the bringing the information top down from the government to the people, because now the audience is moving quickly to the new platform. So the job of the, the journalist in this area is have to to adapt and to um yeah but um how to do it we have to uh a long way to find the answer how to help the journalists to both work in their uh, journalism platform and outlets and also serve the audience um on social media and as i uh, follow your conversation on this um um, talk today, I see a lot of audience um, uh, concerning about the way the government can control both journalism and also the, the, the uh, social media platform. Uh, but as I say before, the more um, control the social media has, the more responsi responsible the social media have to, to bear. And um, as here in our country, we have the press code uh, to regulate the practice of journalists. We also um, on the way to build more rules and regulation, even the, um, the, 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 com the community or the um, bottom up uh, regulations for the social media user. And we are still on the way to have to regulate um, the use of um, both media, social media and journalism to serve the to serve the, the social to serve the information needs of the society and um, still on the way of learning from you. And um, I think um, we are coming to the last minute and uh, I think that um, um, in my opinion, in my opinion, personal opinion, I don't think I we encourage the way they're doing 
journalist at the daytime and working for social media as a part-time job or uh, an additional job because I see a lot of con um, uh, interest of con conflict of interest in doing that. Um, but um, yeah, still on the way we learned uh, and find out the best way to work um, in both media, mainstream media and social media. Thank you. I would simply jump in and 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 uh, ask a little bit until Prita is back, if I'm allowed here to do so. Um, so to be honest, it really surprises me that you think that it's the duty of journalists to uh, serve the government. Um, maybe this is like my my uh, naive European perspective, but I always believed that it's the duty of a journalist to serve the public and not the government, as the uh, journalism is the fourth strength. Uh, so we we have to be able to criticize the government if the government is not providing what we need as a, a public, right? What do you guys think about? Uh can I answer first? And I also want to listen to your opinion. Here, I don't make any judgment that it is the good or bad in the system that we need the press card issued by the government to work as a professional journalist. I just say in this system is unique in the world and it's different. And it still, it still will be there. Um, if we have this system, a uh, political system. And um, the thing that we have in common with the rest of the world is uh, the platform for social media platform. So um, yeah, social media, for example, Facebook is can um, add uh, something more to this system. Uh, I mean, it as the pluralism and it has some new perspective of news um, for our audience. So I think on the one way it's good because it's at um, news perspective and news kind of information. But on the other hand, it's also a land for uh, misinformation, disinformation, and we, um, the audience is hardly to decide which one is the, the proper uh, information to follow. So I've been asked and, here um, to um, ask us speakers to say a few last words to end the panel and the discussion, because it seems that unfortunately P uh, Prita cannot make it back. Um, so uh, if you may allow me, I would start with uh, Sophia, because it also uh, yeah, I'm also interested in hearing your opinion on what uh, we've just heard about the mis, uh, yeah, the misleading and uh, conflict of interest between being a journalist and providing content on social media at the same time working for uh, a news outlet. Sorry, I'm confused. You mean about Vietnam? Or are you talking more generally? First about Vietnam and then in general, <laughs> just to sum um, it up here. <laughs> yeah, just to sum it up. I mean, I don't think I'm the authority here, but I think it's very interesting to hear what the realities are in different countries regarding freedom of expression that we can have. And what I will quickly speak to is I do wonder what will happen to me one day if I go to report in Egypt, for example, where they have imprisoned TikTok stars and where they have imprisoned journalists and I'm both so there, there are concerns that um, you, we are forced to carry especially as these laws inevitably especially regarding to social media in the Middle East these laws far more heavily bear upon women um, and, and, and laws are put against us that find us in difficult positions with with state governments so um yeah, there's 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 an awful lot more to think about than just should a journalist get on social media, depending on your your national context. Thank you very much. And would you consider that like your last words to sum up the session? I think the premise of the session, which is should what was it? Should journalists be on social media or should journalism use it? I mean, Facebook is 17 years old. Um, yes. 
that question is, is a tired question. That's not what uh, any expert in the field is asking. The experts in the field are asking, um, how can we make social media a, a good place for society? I feel like that's the current, that's what we're talking about at the moment. And uh, a lot of us are struggling to find answers, at least answers that are actually listened to by tech platforms. And as, as content creators and journalists, we are entering that mealy. We are entering that, that like war space, trying to battle out, out against other content, but also keep ourselves safe and keep our audiences safe. Um, and that for me is the biggest issue of this year. I love what you said the last, to keep our audience safe as well. This is also very important. Thank you very much, Sophia. Imam, would you like to go next? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, in general, uh, I think um, it is, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not speaking uh, from my perspective I, as a content creator. I think um, as social media uh, practitioners and uh, content creator, we all have to uh, understand at least the basic of journalism. Uh, it is mostly about uh, to make sure that what we share to social media and uh, to be reshared by our audience are all true, uh, to, to make sure our, all are verified, but it is also uh, uh, to follow uh, the, the code of conduct, the ethical, and uh, sometimes the linguistic uh, aspects of, uh, of, uh, of uh, journalistic products. Uh, so, for example, uh, you don't do this when when you do uh, when, when you when you make a content about a disaster, about a tragedy, about something that uh, that can uh, that can be sensitive to others. Uh, I think that has to be understood by many, uh, if not all, of uh, the content creators, uh, so that uh, the the contents shared to social media uh, can be true, uh, ethical, uh, useful, and inspiring. Oh, these are three last uh, very inspiring words. So true, verified, inspiring, and ethical. Thank you very much, Imam. And uh, Dr. Lee, would you like to go next and sum up? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm afraid that the most frequent uh, terms that I can speak in this panel is, can you hear me? We all connected and divided by the technology. Uh, and yes, we agree that we are different in the way that we um, perform, um, we do journalism, uh, but we are not quite different in the way we use social media. Uh, so um, our future work is to find the best way to how to connect the two, journalism and social media. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would go last then before we sum up here. Um, so yeah, uh, I would encourage every journalist out there to uh, try out what they like the most about social media. Try to identify a, a role that you would like, like to fit uh, in. Try to find your niche. Try to find your unique selling point. And I think that this will definitely lead to your success on social media, regardless if you're standing in front of the camera or behind the camera, providing content, verifying content, which is important as well, doing community management, doing data analysis, all roles in a team are very important. So thank you very much for all the attendees. Thank you very much for the um, other speakers. Thank you very much. Stay safe and uh, hope to see you someday, maybe live. Uh, through uh, in, in a real session at Not Digital. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.